So here's the problem space that I want to think about today. We are writing some application or some library code or whatever it is that needs to talk to an external service. Now I'm going to focus on the case where we are writing client software and there's some external server software running that we have to interact with. Okay, common enough uh, situation. And I want to say, is there a pattern for making this interaction testable? Is there a pattern that we can bring in that will enable us to, uh, to, to reliably test our own software without needing to talk to the outside world at all times? Uh, and I argue there is. And I wanted to frame this talk around bringing in no external dependencies. Um, so you can see my entire build SBT. It's how I'm going to start the talk. Um, there are the first two lines are actual, are, are just pieces of little client logic. They are totally inessential to the point that I want to make. It's just it's going to need to parse some JSON that I'm you know, wrote a little fake service for, uh, and it's going to need to talk to it over over HTTP. And then aside from that. I like using Scala tests to run my tests. You can use any testing framework you like. None of this talk depends in any, in any essential way on the three library dependencies that we're bringing in. So the situation we were faced with, if I can ever find my mouse, is we want to write a client that talks to an external server. OK, well, if we are inexperienced and naive or just pounding away at the keyboard before thinking things through too much, we might say, well, my client needs to talk to the server, so I know where that server is located. In this case, it's located on localhost, but in reality, it'll be somewhere else. But I'll just hard code those things in, say, you know, make some HTTP requests, and well, I definitely know that whatever my thing sends back, I want it to, you know, return a data type that's useful to me, so I've defined a case class that makes sense in my domain. Wonderful. Please don't like write software like this. Why not? It's not testable. You cannot test this without the external service actually being running and actually sending back the, the exact data that you think it ought to. And this is a problem. Because whenever we have code, there are multiple steps that it engages in. One of the, the most error prone of those is talking to something else over the wire. So how could we improve this pattern? And right now, everything is being done in line. You can't see all of it because the, the, screen, is, the screen resolution is very tiny. But everything is being done in line. And we, you know, the, the, you know, any call to this client actually goes off and fetches. So how could we do better than this? Give me a moment. And turn here and hopefully it reloads. Yes. So let's make a little improvement. Let's follow the separation of concerns principle and say, I'm going to separate out the logic for this client, which, you know, let's say this is a library someone else is going to import. I'm going to separate the logic of getting a user from the RESTful service or whatever the foreign service is, from parsing it into usable bits of information here, like a list of strings when I ask when I send a, query, a title query across or what have you. I'm going to separate that out, and I'm going. I'm going to put all of that logic that was previously in my client in a connector class or a connector object. Well, how much have we achieved of our original goal of being able to test things? Not much. I mean, I have a test suite in the 
in this. And it will run tests, but those tests have to hit the production service. So, and well, depending on how long it takes to compile, um, they will run and they will succeed unless I cut them off first. But we have not really gotten anywhere if our goal is we want to, we want to test our in-process logic in separation from our ability to talk to the outside world. So everything ran, everything succeeded, and over here on my running service, I actually see all those calls come through. So this is clearly a, not enough. And so, we sit down, we, we play some ping pong, we think through, we talk to one of the uh, more senior people on the team, and we come up with an idea. Didn't the gang of four have an idea about this? Or have many ideas about this, but didn't in particular they say it's a good idea to separate behavior, concrete behavior, from a behavioral contract? Does anyone remember what that was called? The, one, the, the pattern I'm thinking of that's from their book is the bridge pattern. It goes by a couple of other names. Um, also known as the interface pattern. That is, why don't we define a behavioral contract and say, my client, instead of simply using a particular connector, my client will just get passed in something which passes that contract, whatever it might be. Well, how does that help us? Let's see. So if I go back to my editor, my client class has not changed at all. You'll have to trust me that I have actually checked out a different branch of code. Well, I lie. One little bit has changed. Before, BiblioClient was a static object. It never changed. Now, at construction time, it gets past something conforming to an interface, a contract. How does this help us test? Or does it? We can create a mock or a fake. Now, many of you will have a favored or favorite mocking or faking library. I didn't import any of those into this project. Um, this is supposed to be a zero dependency talk. If you like one of those libraries, you can use this to instantiate, you can use that to instantiate something conforming to this contract. Or you could just write one yourself. It's, a, it's entirely up to you. There is, in fact, two things in this, in this repo, in this branch, conform, you know, conforming to this contract. One of them is the, tr the real one, and one of them is a fake one. The fake one actually lives in source test. So when you ship your application, when you package it all up, that code won't be there anymore. It's only there for testing. And there's a real one. Now, let's talk a minute about interface design. What does this, this pattern, this bridge pattern, this interface pattern, whatever you want to call it, call for? Well, I'm going to violate the single responsibility principle here. I think that this that this interface, or the things that implement this interface, have a dual responsibility that you can't really pry apart. Responsibility one is, in the case of the, the production code, actually talking to the external service. Responsibility two is gracefully handling what comes back from the external service and translate, translating it into the data types that you have defined for your application, the, the business-specific logic of your application. And in, in, in Scala world, that is almost, that is 95% of the time going to mean case classes. So if you are talking to 
a rest endpoint that, ret that returns things as JSON. You do not pass on JSON strings the rest of your application. You do not pass back generic maps, a map string any, or a map string int to the rest of your application. No. Your, the responsibility here is that get users will parse a list of users or an iterable of users or you know you, you choose the correct container type but it will send off a query a username query and come back and this implementation is responsible for turning that unstructured data into structured data or failing now we had a wonderful bit in the most in the last talk about validation uh, if you're using cats or scala z you can use one, of the, use one of their library classes to do validations. Uh, but since this is a zero dependency talk, let's use the vanilla Scala try, which is a wonderful little workhorse. Pretty much, in my opinion, pretty much every method of your external interface should have a robust uh, outer wrapper class, type class, like try, as its, out, as its outermost class. Because Pretty much every method of your interface with the external world can fail. And in particular, it, part of the responsibility for the class is turning failures, is specifying either through explicit annotations, which Scala really doesn't do well on, or in the testing suite, what failures you expect to see. So if I go down into... Uh, let's see, I believe that's the one I want, yes, I go down into the spec for this unit, this integration test, I've included some failure cases, and in particular, if I search books by, you know, Kernigan and Ritchie, I expect to get a mapping exception back. Now what that means is in the code that I'm running, the response that's going to come back from the server is going to be something that can't be parsed as JSON. That's, uh, sorry, here. Now, in a further iteration of this, if I had 45 minutes instead of 20, then I would go through the process of defining not only domain-specific happy path types like user or book, but domain-specific sad path types like here are the exceptions that we see and here's what they represent in terms of business logic and then make decisions further down in the code. Once, I've gotten, once I'm in an exceptional case, what should happen? All right, but, in any, but what we have here and so we have a, we have one spec that we open, and we have another spec for the fake. Now, why should I have a test for the fake implementation? There are two reasons. Any takers? Reason one, always test your test, your test helpers because this fake is still supposed to conform to an interface contract. If it doesn't conform to that contract, then nothing else that it's used in makes any sense. That then all the tests that I'm doing, the unit tests that I run on anything else, they don't tell me anything. Reason number two, if I seed the fake implementation, the in-memory fake, with, with the right data, I can run pretty much the exact same test suite on the fake and on the real one. As long as I know like one or two real users or one or two real book titles, then I can run the exact same test suite and they should both pass. Now, what does this mean for development? Well, 
is my external service going to continue to run unchanged until the end of time? No, it will not. One day, my external service provider is going to turn around and ship a, ver a new version of it. And that will change the API. There will be breaking changes. And if you've inlined all your calls to that external service, then what you're going to have to do is spend a long, long time hunting through your code to find all the ways that you have used the external service and assumed things about the external service in the process of writing the rest of your code. If you're using the interface pattern, if, you, if you're bridging between an external co a contract and a concrete implementation, then all you have to do is write a new implementation that talks to the, to the, uh, the new external service. You can drop it in. We now have a 1.0 and a 1.1 connector. I kept the 1.0 connector just in case the external provider wants to turn it back on. But you know, we have a real connector that connects to the new service. It follows the exact same contract that the old one did. The reason being, while the external service, and if you um, actually pull up the repo and look at this, the, the data types provided by these two different versions of the service are quite different. But your application doesn't care because the responsibility of the connector is to take whatever the data format is that is returned and turn it into business intelligent objects, or turn it into domain specific objects. And, and in this particular case, one of the two versions, I don't remember which, you have to make like, you know, n calls to get um, book information for one of these. And in the other version, it's, it's all encapsulated into one call. But who cares? From the point of view of the consumer of your library or the, or the, you know, the application code that you're writing, as long as each of these corresponds or conforms to the contract, the interface contract, then it can go along and do its job. We can run the integration tests against the actual service. I may have needed to clean first. We can run the tests against the external service, and everything will be good. All right, while that builds and runs and hopefully succeeds, are there any questions? Question uh, Just for this integration test, you're running it against your production database? Uh, well, I'm running it against a, something that's running over here on localhost, but. In, in this context, though? Yes. Uh, so, so, so right now, uh, this connector has, again, hard-coded uh, endpoints. Now, you can have the connector that talks to the outside world accept, for example, config and say, you know, here's your database that you're running against, here's its, uh, here's its host and port. And so you can have it run against your testing uh, database, you know, in your stage environment or wherever that may be. Um, all of, that is, all of that is totally up to you. But the point is that the integration test goes outside the walls of the, of the JVM and talks to something outside. Um, so an anecdote about this, my, my team was putting together an application. We, were, we 
wanted to use, we had to do some um, local persistence in our application, um, and we wanted, we were using Neo4j, using, and you know, we had a lot of fun building it, it's great to use the graph database, but what ended up happening is there, there was a bug, uh, actually in, I think the Apache Tinkerpop layer above Neo4j that just broke everything we needed to use. And because we had an interface pattern in use, we were able to turn around and drop in a different database, a different persistence layer. One, you know, one of our developers took three days to do it. Where, you know, if this had been tightly coupled, if the, if the persistence code had been tightly coupled throughout our uh, code base, there's no way we could have done that in a sprint. So this is a, you know, this is a pattern with real implications for the resilience and the flexibility of your team. Uh, now, as I say, this, is this talk is designed to showcase the you know, lack of any dependencies that you need. But if you have a mocking library that you like, if you have a dependency injection framework that you like, if you have a, an inversion of control framework that you like, use them. But use them in this way to instantiate classes or instantiate values that adhere to contracts that talk the logic, the business logic of your application. Thank you.